Please welcome The Rubin Report's Dave Rubin and the one and only Richard Dawkins. Thank you very much. Uh, doctor, were you looking for the protesters? Was that it? <laughs> they never come. I don't know why not. But yeah. As far as I know, we're, we're just with a bunch of bright New Yorkers, and yeah. there were no protests outside. Is that kind of disappointing these days? It is a bit, yes. <laughs> we could probably rile them up a bit. We'll, we'll see what we could do. Uh, so there's a ton. This, first off, is an absolute thrill and honor for me. I, I've been trying to get you on my show since before I had a show, I think. Uh, and I thought the right way to start would be a little bit about the free speech space and, and the fake news space and that whole thing. Yesterday, you were supposed to be speaking at Berkeley. You did not speak at Berkeley. They, they deplatformed you. That's, that's a new phrase. This has happened to you before. What do, what do you make of what's going on? I don't think it was yesterday, but anyway, you're, you're right that I was deplatformed. It did happen before. Uh, I was deplatformed by a conference in New York State, and um, they then replatformed me again two weeks later with a, a very gracious apology and invited me back. Uh, and they got it all wrong, which of course they had, uh, but I couldn't go, uh, unfortunately. Um, so that it has happened before. And the one in Berkeley, that was, that was to have happened, I think, in a couple of days' time. Um, this is a radio station which I used to love when I lived in Berkeley. I lived there for two years, and it was the, the, this was a sort of liberal beacon at a time in the late 60s when Berkeley was the home of free speech. The free speech movement was in 1963. How have the mighty fallen? Berkeley, the home of free speech, now the home of suppression of free speech. Uh, and that's very sad to me because I love the place. I, I always have loved the place. Um, and. Uh, the, the less said about it, the better, really. Yeah. All right. We'll, we'll do science then. You want to do science? Yeah. Yeah. I'll ask you one other thing on that. Can you give me one, one other, and then, and then we'll go right into science. Uh, when this happens, do you, do you ever have a moment where you go, wow, something really has veered off the path here? Not just yes. in, in politics, but in society as a whole, that we've, we've really lost something that is so important to us. I think we really have. I mean, this is, this, mine is just a minor episode, but there have been a large number of cases where university campuses, um, there have been protests that have prevented people from going to speak at universities because they just don't like what they think they're going to hear. And it's really sad when you think that a university of all places is the place where ideas should be aired and exchanged and disputed and argued over Go along and argue. That's what the university is for. This sort of soft, sappy inability to take something that you find offensive and hurtful. It's pathetic. It's contemptible. No That's place. applause worthy right there. And we see this creeping into the hard sciences, right? I mean, to, to blend this to your book right now and talk about rationality, it was one thing when some of this stuff was happening with the social sciences, but now we see it with the hard sciences, which I think has a lot of people really shocked. I'm not sure why you say hard sciences. I mean, the fact that I happen to be a scientist, that, that's, it, it, it's not scientists who are doing the protesting. It, it's, I don't know who it is, but, it's, but I hope it's not scientists. No, no, not the scientists, yeah. it's, it's the students that are upset about ideas have shifted from just I going after sociology. Right, yes. But it usually is because they, it, it, it offends their sociological sensibilities. I mean, it, it, it usually, I don't think anybody has protested about somebody coming and talking about quantum theory yet. Anyway. Yet. <laughs> yes. That, that'll be the day. So the, the book is called Science in the Soul. And when they, when they sent me the copy, I mean, the title right there. I mean, you, you're a well-known atheist. Science in the soul. How can it be? Well, um, there's, a, there's a chapter um, about killing the soul 50 years on, <laughs> um, which, which begins with, um, I think I just saw it just now. It begins with a definition of soul, um, two different definitions. And one of them is the 
the immortal soul, the religious soul, um, which is the one that's going to be killed. Um, that's okay, you don't have to bother. Um, um, yes, I mean, I, I, I've defined from the Oxford English Dictionary, soul one, like what I call soul one, is the spiritual part of man regarded as surviving after death and as susceptible of happiness or misery in a future state. And that's the one we're going to kill. Um, soul two is intellectual or spiritual power, high development of the mental faculties, also in somewhat weakened sense, deep feeling sensitivity, the seat of the emotions, feelings, or sentiments, the emotional part of man's nature. Um, and I think that you can be emotional about, you can be poetic, certainly, about science. So Carl Sagan, Albert Einstein, uh, many scientists have, have waxed soulful, spiritual, about the beauty of the world from a scientific point of view. I wrote a book myself called Unweaving the Rainbow, which was an attempt to rebut John Keats, who complained about Newton. He thought Newton had spoiled the poetry of the rainbow by explaining it. Mm. Whereas, um, obviously, what I think is that you, it, it becomes more poetic, not less, if you understand about what, what's causing all this beauty. And the world is so full of beauty. It's beautiful that we can understand it. It's beautiful that we who have evolved on this rock orbiting the sun, four billion years of evolution has led to our having a brain and nervous system that's big enough to understand where we came from, why we're here, how big the universe is, how old the universe is, how it's going to end. And we now know all that. And isn't that wonderful? Isn't that beautiful? Can't you feel spiritual, soulful about that? Yeah. What that's about, what I mean by science in the soul. What about the people that do a little bit of part one there, of the, of the first definition, that they accept all of the things that you just said, and they are rational and believe in science and all that? but also have a piece that, that can't be explained, that, that they themselves can't yes, explain. Yes, I'm, I'm reminded of a lovely story by Douglas Adams, who's a great hero of mine. Um, he told a story of a man who didn't understand how television worked, and he thought there must be little men inside the television who were sort of moving the images around. And um, so an engineer sat him down and explained to him about radio waves and about amplifiers and about scan lines and, and, and how they were mod modulated by the radio wave. And how they, so he said, oh, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Yes, I, I see, I understand, I understand how television works. But I expect there are just a few little men in there, aren't there? <laughs> <laughs> so no, I think, I think it's all or none. You've got, you've got to go the whole hog. <laughs> yeah. Rationality, which really is what this, yes. this book is about, um, we don't seem to have much of it right now. I'm not even talking about we can put the colleges aside and all that. Just the, the general level of discourse. Uh, we were talking in the, uh, in the green room a little bit about Twitter. You can boo. Um, you know, that the, the way we communicate right now has very little to do with the rational mind. Do you, do you think that's Well, that, yes, I, and, and you mentioned Twitter. I mean, that is a problem with, with the anonymity. I, I sometimes think when I read uh, Twitter, that lovely quote from George Carlin, who said, think how stupid the average person is. And now reflect that 50% are even stupider than that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, um, I had a tweet, which is a quote from the, from the book. It's, a, it's, a, it's from a, a chapter which is a satire a sarcastic satire of Tony Blair, the former British Prime Minister who started a foundation for the promulgation of religious faith. And my satire said, um, of course, we are going to encourage Sharia law, but only on a strictly voluntary basis, only for, the, <laughs> only for those whose husbands and fathers agree. Well, I mean, <laughs> And you'd be amazed how many people thought that didn't get the sarcasm. I mean, thought I was actually when advocating you, Sharia law. Yeah, but for a guy with your brain, that, that's a pretty big brain in there. You, you're looking at these comments, and, and, and these people are responding. That, that's got to be something. Well, it's pretty depressing. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm accused of being an elitist, and... and I suppose I probably am. I mean, I, um, 
Do we need more of that, though? A little, a little intellectual I mean, when, when, when you said it's a, it's a bad time, it, 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 it's only a bad time for about half. I mean, the, the United States is the greatest scientific country in the world. It has the greatest scientists in the world, greatest intellectuals in the world. Um, what's amazing is that this country manages to do so well in spite of the incubus, the, the burden of the other 50% who are <laughs> dragging you down, um, almost splitting the country into two species, I sometimes think. None of these people here, though. I, I visit America often, and, and I love coming here. And I think yesterday was the first time I'd ever actually met a Trump voter. I mean, they must be out there, but where are they? How does that interaction go, a Trump voter and Richard Dawkins? It was a woman on Fox News. And, uh, she was interviewing me on Fox News, um, I think it was last night. Yeah. Laura something. Yeah. <laughs> Ingram? Was it Laura Ingram? In Laura Ingram. Yeah. She was actually very nice, and, and, and the interview went, went well. But, but, um, she, but I knew she was a Trump voter because she was yelling at somebody immediately before me and on, the, on, the, on the television. Yeah. <laughs> the yelling. There, there's a lot of yelling these days. People Ye don't well, seem to Yelling do simultaneously so that you can't hear a word either of them is saying. That seems to be the, the name of the game. So how do we start getting rationality and science back? How do we sort of pull back from this strange precipice that we seem to be at where everyone is yelling. I'm not known for my skill as a politician, <laughs> as, a, as, a, as a diplomat. I mean, I tend to just put it out there. And I was attacked once by, in a very genial way, as you can imagine, by Neil deGrasse Tyson, who, who said, um, you just put it out there. And that's not persuasion. That's just, that's just putting it out there. And I'm afraid that is what I do. I, I mean, I, I, I write books, and people can read them if they want to. And if they don't, they don't have to. Um, rather like the editor of New Scientist I once quoted, Alan Anderson, who um, he was a very successful editor of New Scientist magazine. And I asked him once in public, uh, what is your policy at, as editor of New Scientist? And he said, our policy at New Scientist is Science is interesting. And if you don't agree, you can fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, uh, as Neil deGrasse Tyson would say, that's, that's no way to persuade anybody. Yeah. And, uh, but it gets the point across. Yes, kind of. Yeah, so perhaps being congenial isn't always the best way to get well, these I, ideas. I like to think I'm congenial, um, but I mean, I, I think when people meet me face to face, they find me quite, quite polite. Um, I seem to have a different reputation in writing. I'm not quite sure why that is, but I, I do. What, what do you think the best way to get young people involved in science is? Well, there are two schools of thought about this, and uh, I've been interested in both uh, since I was professor of public understanding of science. Um, one way is what I call slightly disparagingly the non-stick frying pan approach. If you're talking about, say, the space program, and why one might advocate the space program. The non-stick frying pan approach is to say it's useful. And I sort of kind of satirized it by the non-stick frying pan. It's a spin-off from the space program, something about the heat shield. Mm -hmm. and, and that is supposed by some people to be a good way to interest people in science, to bring it down to earth, to make it relevant to everyday life, relevant to, to the kitchen. And I don't think that's, very, uh, that's the way to do it. My way is the more the Carl Sagan approach, which is the inspiring, poetic, look at the stars, look at the galaxies, think how far away they are, reflect that when you look at a star, you're looking at it a million years ago, 10 million years ago. Uh, you're looking at the sun eight minutes ago. I mean, things like that, the, 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 the poetic beauty of Carl Sagan's language, that's my way. The, the way I advocate for interesting people in science, whether they're children or, or not. There's a lovely children's book, I'm sorry I can't remember the author or the title, who's trying to get across the, so the sheer scale of the universe. Hmm. So he says, get a soccer ball and put it in the middle of the playing field of the school. And then walk 20 paces away and put down, I forget what it is, I think maybe a 
pinhead. And that's the Earth, 20 paces away to scale. And then walk, uh, again, it might be 100 yards or something, might be, it'll be more, and then put down a, a ping pong ball, and that's Jupiter. Now, the, ne the nearest star to the sun, Proxima Centauri, pick up another soccer ball and walk 2,000 miles. And that's the nearest star. Uh, well, that I, I regard as a good way to go. And I've done that with, with children, and they're absolutely riveted. They love that. They, yeah. they love that. Um, I find that so much better than the nonstick frying pan approach or the practical Bunsen burner approach, where everything you do, you have to sort of do an experiment. You have to, you have to heat a test tube or something. I think it's so obviously important that we need scientists. We need to train people to, to be scientists. But we also need to bring science into the culture and make science fascinating in the same way that art or music is, e aesthetically pleasing. And, and that, that's more the way that appeals to me. Yeah. Do you sense with all the sort of political upheaval in America, in the world, the, the conversations we're having, the yelling, the 10 cable box people all screaming at each other at the same time, that there's an interesting and unique opportunity right now. I, I've been saying on my show for a while that I sense that there's fertile ground actually for ideas right now because people are reevaluating everything. Well, that's an optimistic thought. Um, yeah. I, I, <laughs> you know. Yes, let's hope you're right. I, I'm not quite sure how I get a word in edgeways with the yelling, but, but um, yeah. But have you noticed time, times throughout your life where there were, there were suddenly fertile ground, even if it came from reasons that you weren't happy with or that you know, shouldn't have happened, that that's where ideas then start to flourish? Well, maybe. Um, I can't think of any particular examples. Do you, have, do you have examples of that? I don't. I just said it on the show, and people kind of liked it, and then I <laughs> kept. <laughs> I just have a sense, I have a sense when I talk to people and when I interview people right now that, that everyone is reevaluating sort of everything. Their, their okay. political beliefs, um, you know, I just sense that right. people well, are, are willing to at least explore ideas where maybe two years ago, yes, yeah. there's a lot of yelling, but I sense that okay. there's some movement there. Well, let's hope you're right. Let's roll up our sleeves and get down to it. Good. Yeah, we should, yes. right? Yeah. Um, who right now is... Uh, besides you, is, is doing some great work in the, in the scientific field right now. Oh, goodness. I mean, uh, we didn't prepare any of these questions. We, no. We... Um, well, I mean, I'm, I'm fascinated by uh, molecular genetics. It's not a field that I'm in, I'm in, but it's clearly revolutionizing biology. It's turning biology into a branch of computer science. It's digital. And that, that's been clear, really, ever since Watson and Crick, but it's becoming more and more um, utterly, totally digital, um, and um, the um, CRISPR technique of Jennifer Doudna, for example. I mean, she's clearly a real live wire in in the field. Um, ancient DNA. Uh, I'm fascinated by that, by the use of um, DNA techniques to look at archaeology, to look at human ancestry, to look at um, to get the DNA from a woolly mammoth and, and maybe even clone a mammoth, bring, bring it back to life, bring back a Neanderthal human. Um, it worked out well in Jurassic Park, right? Well, that's, that was going back a, long, a lot further. It's a brilliant plot. I mean, the idea of taking insects embalmed in amber and getting blood, that a, that a, the last blood meal of a mosquito taken from a dinosaur, what a lovely idea. That was Michael Crichton, wasn't it? Yes, yeah. Michael Crichton's idea. Um, unfortunately, it's not feasible, um, <laughs> but, it's, but it's beautiful, and that, that's the kind of thing that, 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 that one ought to be able to do. But to bring back Thylacinus, the Tasmanian wolf, to bring back woolly mammoths, uh, to bring back Neanderthal human. Um, Steve Gould said that was the most immoral thing he could imagine, but I can't see why. I think it would, well, I can, I can sort of see objections to it, but yeah. <laughs> um, I, I think the objection, the moral objection to it would be something like that the, that the, the person concerned would be such a, uh, a newsworthy freak show that it would be cruel uh, to, for, to, the, to, to that individual. 
I mean, that, that, I, that I, I do think would be the moral consideration. Yeah, is that just the sacrifice that has to be made for science? Well, I'm not sure I'd want to make it, but, 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 but that, that's the scale of the, of the moral question that I think exists, whereas he clearly thought it was a much bigger thing than that. Yeah, where, where do you uh, draw the line on those moral questions in general, not necessarily about that well, specific I, um, thing? Well, for, for me, the, the big question is, does it, does it cause suffering? And so, um, the, the, in, in this case, the, the, the suffering would, would be of, of an individual be, being a sort of freak show, as, as I said, um, in something like the, the abortion debate. For me, the important thing is, can it suffer? Or, or who is suffering? And um, a, an, a, an embryo that is too young to have a nervous system cannot suffer. And so, um, the, the sort of absolutist morality that says, all human life is sacred, I have no time for. Um, I only have time for morality that is concerned with actual pain actual, or, or fear or, or, or other forms of suffering. Yeah, uh, so you bring up morality. I've had, uh, on my show, I have believers and non-believers and atheists and people of the cloth and all sorts of people. And we've had some interesting debates about morality and religion. Uh, how do you get your morality? Your, and when I ask you that, I mean your personal morality. Well. Uh, I think I get it from I get it the same way most people get it, um, from a kind of. I guess the protesters are here. They're knocking, <laughs> knocking politely. Um, maybe it's yeah. Okay, never mind. Um, <laughs> that could be God knocking at the Jesus door. Jesus wasn't. <laughs> That would Jesus be was a carpenter, after all. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I think that morality needs to be intelligently designed, uh, as opposed to laid down in some holy book. Uh, and um, I saw a wonderful joke picture yesterday, I think it was, which was a picture of the Bible labeled the Goat Herder's Guide to the Galaxy. <laughs> <That was so. laughs> um, yes, intelligent design. Uh, we don't want intelligent design as an explanation for our existence. We've got Darwinism for that. But we do need intelligent design for morality. We do not get our, we should not and do not get our morality from holy books. We clearly don't. If we did, we would be stoning adulterers to death and stoning people for breaking the Sabbath and things like that. Um, we do get our morality from moral philosophy, from uh, legal court cases, from parliamentary discussions, from just general um, talk in the air. I mean, the, the, the moral values that we have in the 21st century are palpably different from those not, just, not even 100 years ago, 50 years ago. Um, the, the changes that feminism has wrought, for example, in the way we use language, the way we could no longer get away with a phrase like one man, one vote. We don't do that anymore. We've had our consciousness raised. If you go back and read, um, well, think that, that women only got the vote in, I forget where it was in America, sometime in the 1920s maybe, was it? It was roughly then in Britain, I think. Uh, in Switzerland, I think the 1970s. Hmm. Um, so we, we are moving on all the time. We've, we've given up slavery, we've given up um, uh, torturing animals for fun, except in Spain. Um, and there's, a, there's what I call the shifting moral zeitgeist, which is going on all the time. And you can see it in the way people talk, in conversation, in, in novels, in, in, in all sorts of things. And it changes faster even than by century by century. It changes decade by decade. Um, if you think about the way warfare was conducted in the middle of the 20th century, the Second World War, um, you have um, bombers going over the cities of Coventry and Dresden, to say nothing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, um, which were killing, slaughtering civilians by the thousands. And nowadays, in modern warfare, uh, if civilians get killed, it's a matter for apology. Um, well, 
it's bad that they still get killed, it's bad that anybody still get killed, but still it's a big change, it's a big improvement. We are changing all the time in the right direction. Stephen Pinker's Better Angels of Our Nature shows this historically over a very long period. We are getting better, and it has nothing to do with religion. It has to do with some mysterious change of what's in the air almost. And, and I don't mean that in a mystical way. It's, mm -hmm. it's no doubt the sum of things like, as I say, moral philosophy, general conversation, journalism, law, parliamentary debate, and so on, which all come together to move the move the zeitgeist on. And no doubt that, that, will, that will continue. And so that's where I get my morality from. It's where you get your morality from. And even if you're religious, you don't actually get your morality from the Ten Commandments. I mean, the idea that you get your morality from the Ten Commandments, Christopher Hitchens satirized it rather well when he, when he said, for one thing, thou shalt not kill is just about the only one of the Ten Commandments any religious person actually knows. And Christopher satirized it by saying, Moses came down from the mountain with these tablets and said, thou shalt not kill. Oh, thou shalt not kill. <laughs> oh, we never thought of that. You, you dedicated the book to Christopher. Yes. I, uh, I think almost every day, I, at some point during the day, I think, man, I wish we had Hitchens and Carlin. Those, those are the two for me. That, yeah. I, that I wish I you had. Yes. Do, do you wish you had more public allies in, in these fights? Yes. Uh, I mean, it, it, it's, it, the, the, the loss of Christopher was a, a huge tragedy as well. I mean, personal tragedy, obviously, but also tragedy for uh, intellectual life. And I dedicated the book to him. Um, the, the last chapter of the book is the speech that I made um, in his honor, shortly before he died, very shortly before he died. Um, and I ended up, um, ended the book, which is ed dedicated to him, as I say, reverting to the, the word soul and saying about Christopher, this intrepid warrior for truth, this cultured, courteous citizen of the world, this devastating, coruscating enemy of lies and cant, well, maybe he has no immortal soul, none of us has. But in the only meaning of the words that, make any, that makes any sense, the soul of Christopher Hitchens is among the immortals. Hmm. <laughs> his, his dedication to truth is, is the part, and, and your dedication to truth. We seem to be picking our own truths these days. Uh, there's this, the idea of fake news. We cater yes. ideas to ourselves yes. uh, that just reinforce the things that we already yeah. believe. So I'll ask that in, in two parts. First, wh how, where do you get your news? Oh, um, mostly from the internet and, and also from, uh, I take The Guardian in, in Britain um, and I log into the New York Times and CNN and BBC and the independent. Um, but on the question of fake news, um, it, it's particularly bad just at the moment in this political atmosphere. And, and uh, when we have in this country a, a, a pr president who, who lies so much, he doesn't even know he's lying. He's just, he's just a chronic liar. Um, and that, of course, is terrible. Uh, but I think also there's been a, a longer term atmosphere of um, devaluing of objective truth in favor of a kind of subjective, emotional, my truth is not the same as your truth. Well, it's true for me even if it's not true for you. Uh, my opinion is what matters, never mind about whether it's true or not. And that gets, I think, even some encouragement from certain academic disciplines, which had begun sort of whispering campaign against the, 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 the values of objective truth. And I think that this is where science really comes into its own. Science is about objective truth. It's not about opinion. It's not about uh, subjective, your truth is different from my truth, or I'm entitled to my truth and you're entitled to yours. And, and, and that, that, that is anathema to the scientific spirit. 
Do you I, I do feel passionately about that. Yeah, do you feel that that sort of postmodern thinking that yeah. we all sort of have our own truths, that that actually is the biggest threat to science? Or do you look at someone like Trump or, or just some any other leader out there that, that either is cutting funding to science or, or whatever Yeah, else? I mean, tr Trump is a, is a more Im immediate threat, but the, but, the, but the other may be a more insidious one in the long, in the long term. Yeah. Um, I, I want to go back to, uh, to religion for a moment because yeah. one, of the, one of the things that I find people are struggling with the most, and I know you've talked about it a lot, is separating ideas from people. Yes. That we should be able to criticize ideas, and that doesn't mean you're criticizing everyone that prescribes necessarily to all of those ideas or that we all pick and choose ideas and have weak spots and blind spots. Can you talk a little bit about ideas versus Yes, people? that's absolutely right, and, and, and there's no doubt about it that, that many people identify with their ideas, religious ideas especially, so much. I thought he was chasing a mouse. Oh, no, no. <laughs> Do a better job. That seems... It's audience questions, just kidding. Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Um, there is a tendency for people, I think especially religious people, to identify so strongly with their ideas, with their religious ideas, that they think that to criticize their, uh, their religious ideas, to criticize their, their beliefs, is tantamount to insulting them personally. It's tantamount to saying, you've got an ugly face. And this is so wrong. I mean, it's so, so um, retrograde because you, ideas are there to be criticized. You must be able to defend your ideas. If they're any good, then you should say, I believe this because, I believe this because so and so, because X, Y, and Z. You, you, you cannot just, just shout and say, oh, you've insulted me. You've, you've, you've mortally offended me by criticizing my ideas. Uh, I, again, to quote Christopher Hitchens, he said, you're offended by what I've just said. I'm still waiting to hear your point. <laughs> <laughs> Stephen Fry said it even more. Stephen Fry, who's such a sweetheart, such a, such a gentle, darling man, said, you're offended. Well, so fucking what? <laughs> Your ideas are not you. You are a person, and I will not offend you as a person. I will not, I will not insult you as, as a person, but I will criticize your ideas. I love the quotation from the British journalist Johan Hari, who said, I respect you as a person too much to respect your ridiculous ideas. Yeah. <laughs> A lot of people have trouble getting this, though, right? I mean, th this they is they certainly do. Yeah. yeah, this has gotten you in hot water on, on social media and things because there, you know, there's a certain set of ideas right now which which you do openly criticize. Well, that, I mean, that, that's that's one thing that gets me into trouble. And another thing I think is is that some people find clarity threatening. Another thing is that I tend to use words precisely as they're defined in the dictionary, and. Um, Whereas other people interpret those words according to how they make them feel. And so, um, what was an example of that? I had one only yesterday, I think. Um, I've forgotten what it was, but an, an, an earlier example was that I once wrote in the New York Times that anybody who d does not believe in evolution is either ignorant, stupid, or insane. Now that, if you think about it, is actually a statement of sober fact. It really is, it really is. <laughs> because um, uh, b by far the, the, the most important one of those three, ignorant, stupid, or insane, is ignorant. And we're all ignorant of many things. Um, as I said, I, I said somewhere I'm ignorant of baseball and Polynesian nose flutes. <laughs> and every, everybody's ignorant of, of most things, so I'm ignorant of most things that there are to be, to, to be known. It's not an insult, it's a statement of fact. And anybody who doesn't believe in evolution is probably ignorant. And that's not an insult, just a simple statement of fact. But people don't hear it as a statement of fact. You tell them, well, go and look it up in the dictionary. <laughs> it's not an insult, it just, it just means you, d you don't know. And somebody who doesn't believe in, in, in evolution they could be stupid or insane, but it's much more likely that they just don't know. In other words, they're ignorant, and it's up to us as scientists to do something about it um, and teach them. 
Well, that's... <laughs> Do you find it refreshing when people say, I don't know, just that simple phrase? I yes, don't I mean, know. That, that's right, yes, I, I do. Uh, and I, I say it myself a lot. Uh, science proceeds by people not, not knowing and wanting to know, trying to do something about it. I would be remiss, I'm gonna to get to the audience questions, but if having you here as a big sci-fi guy, talk to me a little bit about AI and where you think this is gonna take us and will it make us evolve differently, faster? Well, I, I'm not sure I'd use the word evolve, but um, it, it could be that, uh, I mean, I, I think AI is, I'm committed to the, to the view philosophically that, as a, as a philosophical naturalist, that there's nothing in our brains that isn't govern, governed by the laws of physics. And so, in principle, it must be possible to, simulate everything that a brain does in silico. Um, and so, in principle, it must be possible to make robots that are capable of doing everything that humans can do. And um, if, and, and some people are very alarmed at that idea that, that they'll take our jobs and maybe even get rid of us because we won't be needed anymore. And um, as you say, this is science fiction at the moment. It's science fiction that has to be taken seriously, like all good science fiction. Um, and there are people like Elon Musk and Stephen Hawking who are seriously worried about it, and you have to listen to them. They're, they're highly intelligent geniuses, both of them. Um, so I, I'm, part of me is rather excited by the idea. As a scientist, I'm intrigued by the idea that building computing machines that are capable of doing what humans can do uh, will help us to understand how we, how we work and, and will solve some of the great philosophical questions that remain. On the other hand, if they really did suppress us because we're not needed, that's clearly something to be a bit worried about. I mean, it could be that they'd make a much better job of running the world, world than we do. Uh, and since I, I think I'm committed to the view that they must be capable of emotions like being happy, they might increase the, the sum of I won't say human happiness, the sum of sentient being happiness in the world. So it might not be all bad. I'll take that as hopeful. That, uh, yeah, <laughs> I'll take that. All right, let's, uh, let's jump into audience questions. Uh, I heard you say backstage you had no rules so people could submit anything, and I shuffled them a little bit here, so I'm just gonna go anywhere. Uh, you believe Darwin's theory of evolution is the only theory that can't account adequately for the phenomenon of life. Why only? Well, that's very interesting. Um, there, there is a chapter in the book called Universal Darwinism, which, which advocates exactly that point of view. Um, it, Darwinism means natural selection, uh, e evolution by natural selection. Um, not all evolution is governed by natural selection, even here. Uh, plenty of evolution is random with respect to natural selection, it's random drift. But adaptive evolution, evolution in the direction of improvement, getting better at doing something, like getting better at flying or seeing or swimming or, or digging or climbing or, or thinking, um, that um, is what natural selection is extremely good at doing. And uh, no other theory so far has ever been proposed that can do that. The only one remotely competitive is Lamarckism, which is the, the um, combination of um, the inheritance of acquired characteristics plus the principle of use and disuse. Use and disuse means um, the more you use a bit of yourself, the bigger it gets. And this is true of muscles, for example. The more, uh, that's what training's all about. The more you use certain muscles, the bigger they get. If you couple that with the principle of inheritance of acquired characteristics, somebody who goes to the gym and builds up muscles then has a child with, with a tendency to develop bigger muscles. That would be Lamarckian evolution. Mm. And what I argue in the chapter is that although it works for muscles, it doesn't work for the vast majority. It cannot work for the vast majority of adaptations. Things like eyes, for example, which get better at seeing. 
there's no possible way in which simply seeing makes your eyes better at it. Um, lenses don't become clearer because photons wash through them. Uh, you don't develop an iris diaphragm to open and shut to let in the, the right amount of light just, just by simply exercise. Um, natural selection does that effortlessly. Natural selection does any improvement in the body anywhere, no matter how deeply buried in the biochemistry of the cells. If it's an improvement, it improves the chances of the animal surviving and reproducing. Natural selection will grab it and will build it in to future generations. Natural selection can produce any kind of improvement you can imagine. Lamarckism simply cannot do it. So I dispute the claim that's been made by various biologists that says Lamarckism is a fine theory. It might work on other planets. It just happens not to work on this planet because we don't have inheritance of acquired characteristics. That's wrong. Even on a planet where you had inheritance of acquired characteristics, you could not get complex adaptation like eyes and ears uh, by, um, and brains even. Um, by Lamarckian means. So I, I go in the chapter, I go through all the, all the alternatives that have ever been suggested and show not only that they don't work, but they cannot work, they couldn't work. So there remains the possibility that there's some theory nobody's thought of. And that, I, I cannot rule that out. Um, all I can do is put my shirt on. The, I, 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 I would bet a large sum that if you've, if life is ever discovered on other planets, I would bet everything I have that it, that it, will, be, it will be Darwinian life in some sense. It wouldn't be in detail, it wouldn't be similar. I mean, it wouldn't be the same, it would be similar. Uh, uh, there would have to be some sort of genetics, but it might not be DNA, that, 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 that kind of thing. It seems you connect atheism with acceptance of the theory of evolution. Can't atheism stand alone without the slightest nod to evolution as if the theory was never proposed? Oh, goodness, I doubt that. Um, because we've got this stupendous problem of explaining our existence, not our just, I mean, the existence of all living things. Uh, any, anybody who thinks that underestimates the colossal improbability of a living organism. I mean, think about any living organism you like, but, but just take a bird, for example. Um, it's a beautifully constructed machine that can fly and walk and peck and reproduce. Um, highly complicated machinery, devastatingly complicated, which is everything is geared to this one task of surviving and reproducing in the particular way that birds do it. Fish do it another way, monkeys do it another way. Um, to to uh, abandon that and say I'm still an atheist would be a very, very hard thing to do. I once had an argument with an eminent philosopher. He's now dead, so I can mention him, A.J. Eyre, Sir Alfred Eyre. And I said it would be very hard to be an atheist before Darwin. And he said, why? What's the problem? And, and I, I wrote a book, actually, to try to explain to him. It was called The Blind Watchmaker, uh, to explain to him what the problem was. I think and you, you just simply, you, if, if you think that, you just don't get what an enormously complicated thing um, a, a living organism is, let alone the entire panoply of life. I'll, I'll throw a bonus one in uh, off that, which is, I think I heard you partially answer this uh, with Sam Harris in LA a couple months ago, uh, but when you had your stroke about, about a year ago, uh, did it challenge any of your beliefs or, or lack of beliefs? No, um, uh, it, 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 um, it, it, it reinforced my um, faith in the scientific medicine. I, I was very well treated in... in <laughs> so you didn't go to a shaman? No. Um, some of you may have read Dan Dennett's magnificent uh, article called Thank Goodness, which he wrote after he was, when he was recovering from a very, very serious heart problem when he very, very nearly died. And um, he said that various people had written to him saying they were praying for him and things like that. So he, he, re he replied, and did you also sacrifice a goat? <laughs> <laughs> but he, he, he then went on. No, actually, I think he said he was too polite to give that, that, that reply. 
But he then went on to say, what I do want to thank is, is, is not, not thank God. I want to thank the surgeons who worked on me for eight hours, um, the, the man who invented the electroencephalogram, the, the man who invented the MRI scanner, um, uh, the anaesthetist, all the nurses, the people in the laundry who coped with my blood-stained sheets. Um, he gave a great list of, of people that he, that he thanked. And it's a wonderful essay. I, I recommend you read it. It's called Thank Goodness. Google it. Uh, well, I'm glad you mentioned Dan Dennett, because I think this is partly related to some of, some of the work he does. Do you believe that quantum physics allows for the possibility of free will, namely physics is not necessarily deterministic? Well, um, the principle of indeterminacy has been, the Heisenberg's principle has been widely misunderstood as being a kind of get out, a sort of give, give, us, give us free will. Um, I mean, I, I, I hate the free will question, I'm, I must confess, because I'm, I'm not a philosopher and, and I, I've, I've read some of the stuff on it, but I, I'm not good at answering the question. I rather tend to revert to Christopher Hitchens' answer to the question, do you believe in free will? I have no choice. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know which question I'm going to do last, so I'm going to put that one there. Uh, how do you evaluate the contradiction between capitalism's need for scientific development on one hand and its insatiable drive for competition and profit that interestingly seems to cling to mystification and religious thinking for its cover? That is a loaded question if I've ever heard one. Sorry. Well, not that it's, it's loaded with complication. Let me have another Yeah, why don't you uh, feel that one? You guys can talk amongst yourselves for a moment. <laughs> Capitalism, uh, capitalism's need for scientific development on the one hand, and its insatiable drive for competition and profit. So it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a contradiction between the need for scientific development on the one hand, capitalism needs scientific development on the one hand. On the other hand, it has an insatiable drive for competition and profit. Um, which the, the questioner thinks is incompatible with scientific development. Whoever wrote this question is having the moment of their life right now. <laughs> Richard Dawkins examining my seems, question. Seems to cling to mysti mystification and religious thinking for its cover. Drive for competition and profit. I don't get why competition and profit, the drive for competition and profit, <laughs> seems to cling to mystification and religious thinking for its cover. I think the author of this question has written a book about this, <laughs> um, which I would be interested to read, but for the moment, I, I don't, yeah. Fair enough, fair enough. Put that one over there. Uh, we touched on this a little bit at the beginning. Uh, if you want kids interested in science, teach how we came from fish, not lived in one. So what do you need to yeah, do? Yeah, yeah, well, I like that, there you yeah. go. So what do you need to do to make the theory of evolution the law of evolution? Uh, cosmetics can have a doctor approved, uh, oh, cosmetics can be doctor approved. Can't scientists have the word law approved too? Yes, um, I like that. Uh, I'm not sure I keem, I'm so keen on the word law in this case. I, I'd just rather use the word fact. Um, evolution is a fact. We must stop calling it a theory because it just simply misleads people. The, the current orthodox way to handle this is to say scientists use the word theory in a different way from lay people, but that just doesn't seem to work. We can't get that across. And it, it's only partially true because scientists do use the word theory as a synonym for hypothesis as well. Um, and so, although it is true that, it, that something like the, the theory of gravity uh, is, a, is, is not just a hypothesis that might be true and might be false, Nevertheless, scientists do use the word theory um, to mean something that is tentative and might be wrong, might be right. So I want to stop calling evolution a theory. Just stop it. Uh, uh, lo lo lovely sketch by, um, who's that comedian who does the tele... Who? Bob Newhart. Bob, Bob Newhart. He, he plays a psychiatrist. Um, and uh, he has a woman who comes to him because she has a, a, a morbid fear of being buried alive in a box. And, he, and so he says, well, it'll cost you $5. Um, I want you to listen very carefully 
to the following two, I'm just going to say two words, and I want you to take very careful note. So she gets ready, and he says, Stop it! <laughs> <laughs> so, we're going we're to stop calling evolution a theory. Evolution is a fact. Michael Roos said it's a fact, fact, fact. Um, it, it's a fact that is established as surely and securely as any fact in science. Law, I'm not so sure I'd call it a law. Uh, it, uh, I think that's going to confuse people in other ways. I, I have used it, the word law in this context in my chapter in the book on um, un universal Darwinism, which I mentioned earlier. I think I, I'm, I said something like, Darwinism, Darwinian natural selection, may turn out to have the same l universal lawful properties as the great laws of physics. Physicists are committed to the view that the laws of physics apply all over the universe. Um, so I didn't mind using the word law there, but I think it's confusing to say it's not a theory, it's a law. I'd rather say it's a fact. It's a, it, it, it's a fact that we observe, it's a fact that we understand. All right, well, uh, first off, I know you're gonna be uh, taking some time to sign uh, copies of your book, which came out in the United States today. Today, that's right. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so Richard will be doing that after, and I thought this would be an appropriate one to end on. Richard, how do I respond to a friend when she says, quote, everything is good or bad energy? She says bananas are bad energy, so don't eat them. <laughs> Putting bananas aside for a second, good or bad energy, is there such thing as good or bad energy? How do, what do you do? <laughs> Uh, I wonder if the friend is here. <laughs> um, energy is one of those much misused words. Um, it, it has a precise meaning, it's the capacity to do work, uh, and it's an important concept in physics. Uh, it is misused horribly by mystics and charlatans who are all the time trying to sort of balance your energies and balance your chakras and things like, like that. Um, if uh, you divide the world into, world into things that have good energy and bad en energy, then the kindest thing I can say is you're simply misusing the word energy. Uh, <laughs> and to be slightly more unkind, I would say bollocks. <laughs> well, give it up for Richard Dawkins, everybody.